things. One, you need to understand that uh, the affliction of the world, the first mention of affliction was found uh, over in the uh, Pentateuch where he talked about them being afflicted by the Egyptians for 430 years. Uh, the world will afflict you for being different from them. Right? So, you know, people in the world, they've got a tendency to hate people that are different from them. You need to understand God made everybody the way he wanted them. It just, it, I, and I thank God for my heritage tonight. And you ought to thank God for yours and everybody in the world ought to thank God for theirs tonight. But you've got a whole lot of that that, that goes on. But, so the Egyptians, they afflicted. And they're, the Egypt's a type of the world. I hope you understand. When we were at Tabernacle, we had Canaan, we had... Egypt, and we had Moab, all right? Now, I don't have, you say, well, what's that? Canaan was the bottom floor, first half of the road. That was Canaan's land, all right? That's where everybody shout, praise God, and have a good time. And then you had uh, Egypt. You had Egypt, the last half of the uh, pews where not as much activity took place. And then if you happen to get up in the top up there, uh, we call that Moab. That was God's wash pot up there. So what happens is you've got an affliction that takes place, and that affliction, affliction takes place for the world. Second thing, affliction of that type is always satanic in nature. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness and heaven. Hey, this Satan's behind this. Satan hates you and he turns the world against you. But uh, you can also be afflicted of God. There's a couple of times in the Psalms where David thanked God that God had afflicted him. It means to punish you for a wrongdoing. Matter of fact, he spoke in one place of the bones that thou hast broken. So we've got affliction that I preached on last week. If you look at the middle here, it said, is any merry? So we're going to deal with that one tonight. Now, is any merry is between... Uh, the third one, which is simply is any sick among you. So you've got affliction on one side, which is normally satanic, done by the world, sometimes chastening hand of God. He said, if God chastens you, listen, you lift, you lift up your hands and hang down and strengthen your feeble knees. Uh, just take it on the chin. Uh, you deserve it, so you got it. The other side is something that not necessarily is your problem. It can be, and, and James deals with it. Got sickness on the other side. So what we've got is in the middle, the Holy Spirit of God put the phrase, is any merry? Now, if, when you're reading this context, you would think, why in the world did he put that in this context? Because when you go down through the end of the book of James, he's talking about confessing faults. He's talking about sickness. He's talking about healing. He's talking about all these things, these terrible things that happen, but just for no reason seemingly to the casual reader. When I say casual reader, sometimes we read without studying the Word of God. If you see something you don't understand, you need to understand there's something there that you don't know. So if you see something you don't understand, that's when you have to try to put spiritual understanding out of the Word of God into it. So in the middle of this affliction on one side and sickness on the other, he asks a question, is any Mary? Notice what he said about the Mary. Let him sing songs. Then he goes right back into the sickness on the other side. Now, someone once said this, and I believe this is what the Bible's teaching. You are either going into trouble, you're out of trouble, or you're in trouble. We live in hard times. I think everybody understands that. And if you're in trouble today, I want you to hope, Lord willing, you'll eventually come out of it. Uh, sometimes trouble is open-ended. I, I don't like that. If, if I'm going to have surgery, I'm one of them. I want them to get me today while they've got me. If I went to the hospital with a heart cath and they said, well, we can't put stents in, we're going to have to bypass you, then I'm going to tell them, I know that you've got a surgical team on standby right now. They have to have that when they do a heart cath. They have to have a heart surgical team standing there ready in case something goes wrong with that heart cath. 
because they can rupture your aorta. They can do a lot of things with a heart cap. Now, Lord willing, that wouldn't happen, but they've got somebody that's there. So in the middle of this, we find you're either in trouble or out of trouble or coming into trouble or you're in some... In the middle of this, he puts the words, are you happy? Now, Mary does not necessarily mean happy, but I'm going to substitute that tonight. If you're not in trouble tonight, are you happy? We have a tendency uh, to take things for granted in, in life. I, I believe everybody here that some time or the other is uh, capable of doing that. You get up in the morning, especially you younger people, you feel good, you get up, you have your coffee, have your breakfast, you drive to work, you work all day, you come back home, you sit down and relax, you eat supper, you go to bed, everything's rocking pretty good, your bills are paid, everybody's health is basically good. And so you're in a state where you ought to be happy with where you are. But so many times we just kind of move through life without thanking God for where we are in life. And I think that's what he's talking about in the midst of affliction and in the midst of sickness in that middle someplace. Hey, there ought to be some place that you're happy. Some place that you're merry. What is merry? Merry means that you're joyful. And the Bible got a lot to say about merriment. I'll deal with it in just a moment. But I believe our verse is set this way because we tend to worry about bad times before we get to them. Somebody said that worrying is like paying interest on a loan that you may never have to take out. You know, I've seen God take care of our worries before we had anything to even worry about. You ever been worried about something? God took that thing, just took it away, and you say, Woo, didn't take Him long to do that, all right? So we have a tendency to worry, but we also have a tendency to take for granted. Let me give you a good illustration. We live in the Bible Belt. That means a lot of people go to church somewhere. They may not be a Baptist or independent Baptist or whatever. There are different denominations, different flavors, everything out here. But when you go to restaurants, down here you see this a little more, but you see so many people that order their food but never take the time to bow their head and thank God for that food. They don't do that. Do you pray over your food when you're in a restaurant? You bow your head and pray over your food. Do you pray over your food at home? Do you thank God for what you've got? Or do we have that tendency to take for granted these things like these blessings belong to us by default. We use the word default a lot today. I've, I've learned a lot of times if you're having a problem with a uh, computer, you just have to go back to what's there by default and then you can perk it a little bit and uh, fix it up a little bit later. All right, You can take care of that. But he's talking about are you married? If you marry, are you happy with what your station is in life? Now, I thank God today. I, I guess I'm perfectly healthy. I don't know of any real issues that I've got. All my numbers are stable. I go to my doctor. My doctor, matter of fact, she is lessening my medications instead of increasing my medication. She's taking them down a notch, and I thank God for that. She said, you're stable. I don't want to mess with you. I said, lady, I don't want you to mess with me. I want you to leave me alone, all right? She is simply my prescription writer. That, that's the only reason I go up there. She goes over my numbers. She says, asks me all these questions. Uh, are you suicidal? And I said, of course, I'm a pastor. You know, I just, I, I have a good time with my doctor. She's a sweet lady. Her name's Gretchen Caneb. She's a German lady, just as sweet and a good doctor. I love my doctor to death. But do we thank God for our station in life? He wants you to understand if you're not in trouble and not going into trouble or just coming out, you need to, you need to have some merriment in your life. The Bible talks about that. But he talks about worry over in Matthew chapter 6. Take therefore no thought for the morrow. Listen, we used to say don't worry about it. 
Just don't worry about it. You know, Christians say, I don't get, uh, I don't worry. I just get uh, extremely concerned sometimes. Hey, hey, we don't go to the beach. We go to the coast. You know, we've got all these words that we uh, set in there that we do. But he's talking about is tomorrow. For tomorrow shall take thought for the things of itself. In other words, you face tomorrow when tomorrow gets here. That's why he spoke earlier in the book of James. No man knoweth what lies on tomorrow. So don't worry about what tomorrow brings. But merriment, what is it? It's a good thing. You know, God wants you to be happy. God wants you to be merry. Over in Proverbs, he, he, he had a lot to say about it, but Proverbs 15, 13, most of us can quote this uh, today. But uh, hey, he said that a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. A merry heart. What's the best medicine you can have? The number one killer in America is stress. You need to understand that. Stress is a killer. Stress elevates your blood pressure. Stress will take you down. Most people that die of heart attacks early, it's because somehow, some way, they are putting stress on their heart. Now, it's not always the way. Sometimes you have what we call an anomaly. Somebody will die perfectly good shape or whatever at a young age. Uh, but you need to understand they had an underlying problem someplace. But at the same time, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. In Proverbs 15, 15, just two verses later, the Bible said, A merry heart maketh a continual feast. If you've got a merry heart, everything around you is a little bit sweeter. He's talking about continual feast. Sometimes we feast and then sometimes we fast. Sometimes we have plenty, sometimes we don't have enough. A continual feast means day after day after day after day after day. Listen, you've got food on your table, clothes on your back, shoes on your feet. You've got a roof over your head. Hey, boy, you want to look at something. You look at the damage done in the Ukraine to these cities where millions of people lived and there are no houses. They talk about taking a city. What is there to take? I mean, they just blew the thing away. When these people go back, their jobs are gone, their homes are gone, everything. Did you know the Ukraine produces over 40% of the world's wheat? How many knew that about that little country? Over 40% of the world's wheat comes out of the Ukraine. You're talking about a famine of bread going to take place in a lot of countries. They're not going to have much of anything over there. Now, a continual feast means I had all I wanted today. I'll have all I want tomorrow. I'll have all I want next week. I'll probably have all I want next month. You say, well, what if you don't have any bread? That's probably a good thing around my house. Man shall not live by bread alone, the Bible says. And some people, they, hey, how many love bread? Oh, come on. Everybody in here just about likes bread. A continual feast. And then he said that merry heart again doeth good like a medicine in Proverbs 17, 12. And he talks about a smiling face or he talks about the drive up the bones. So he says a lot about merriment. Another reason for this sermon is that People can be merry and not worship while they're doing that. Over in Ecclesiastes, he said this, Then I recommend, or I commend mirth, because a man hath no better thing under the sun than to eat and to drink and to be merry, for that shall abide with him of his labor the days of his life which God giveth him under the sun. That means that God wants you to enjoy the things that you have. He wants you to enjoy. You know, I enjoy as much as anything in the world sitting out on the deck. Today was a stay-at-home day. I know that we may have to be gone for a couple of three days because, you know, just may have to do that one of these days shortly and glad to do that. But I'm trying to get studies ahead. I, I try to do that for a lot of different reasons. But today was a study day. They said it's going to be a washout. I took them at their word. And typical news media, they missed it. 
Everything just kind of blew away. I was thinking, boy, big storms are going to roll in and limbs will be falling and trees across the road and, and all this. And you know, boy, you know how March is. It comes in roaring like a lion, goes out gentle as a lamb. So I made a study day out of today. I did that intentionally. I'm trying to get some studying done, get some work done. But sometimes, listen, we, we fail to realize God wants us to have a good time. Over in Psalms 95, he said this, Let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before His presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto Him with psalms. For the Lord is great God and a great King above all gods. In Psalms 100, He said, Enter into His gates with thanksgiving, into His courts with praise. Huh? Did anybody enter into church thanking God tonight? Hmm? Thank God you got the health to be here. You're not sick. Thank God for the liberty that we have to be here, the privilege tonight to assemble ourselves together with the people of God. What a joy. We ought to be a thankful people when we come. In His courts with praise, be thankful unto Him and bless His name. Now, I'm going to give you three things tonight. If you're merry and if you're happy, if things are going good for you, one, you need to rejoice. That's what he's talking about here. He's talking about singing psalms, and I may deal in just a moment with the singing part of it. But the first mention of the word rejoice is found over in Exodus 18. Again, I love the first and the last mention principles of Bible interpretation. And it's when the children of Israel had been delivered, the army of Pharaoh had drowned. Now they have come to Sinai, at Sinai in Arabia. Right beside of Sinai and Arabia is a little place called Midian. It's a little country there, and that's where Moses tended to Jethro's flocks. When Jethro knew what had, what had transpired, he came to Moses and he rejoiced. Listen to what he said. In Mo, Jethro rejoiced for all the goodness which the Lord had done to Israel, for he had delivered him out of the hand of the Egyptians. Listen, first mention is... It's rejoicing for deliverance. One, God saved our unrighteous uh, soul. We ought to rejoice forever about that. I mean, thank God. You look around at the people today, they are deceived. They don't even go to church. They don't care anything about going to the house of God. They don't care about living for God. They don't care about the things of God. And yet they will mouth Christianity to you. All right, They talk about, well, y'all pray for us. Or, I, I love that. They say, well, I, I'm not going to be in church, but I'll be there in spirit. My little sister came down and picked up my older brother today and met my younger brother uh, at, uh, not Waffle House, at the... Uh, you know, that thing, right? What, honey? Cracker Barrel. <laughs> and they sent me pictures of it. I told them, I said, I'll be there with you in spirit. That's my sister, I know her. She probably thought, well, that won't cost me anything. Huh? You ought to rejoice. You ought to be glad. The last mention is found in Revelation 19.7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. What a day that's going to be. Hey, I'll guarantee you, you're going to be rejoicing in that day. So what you find is both the first and last mentions of rejoicing have to do with deliverance. Thank God for that. Psalms 118 said, This is the day that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Hey, did God make today then we ought to be glad and rejoice. And did he make, is, hey, he's, he's making tomorrow, Friday, next week. He's talking about rejoicing tonight. Rejoice in the Lord all the way. Singular. And again, I say rejoice. Second thing, if you're married tonight, you ought to be thankful. You ought to be thankful. I preached one time at Thanksgiving on unthankful. Now, you won't find that in your dictionary. It's U-N-T-H-I-N-K-F-U-L. Unthankful. What's that mean? That means we don't think. What is unthankful? Unthankful is because we're unthankful. And if we're unthankful, then we're ungrateful. 
We live in days when people are no longer grateful. When's the last time somebody said thank you to you? You open a door. I opened a door for a lady one time, and she came right on through and turned her head the other way when she went through the door. I didn't say a word to her. But an old man standing in the post office turned around and dressed her down, son. Dressed her down. I, he, he was probably in his 80s. He was still in pretty good shape, and he saw what she did. I didn't say, I didn't say you're welcome, you know. That, that's the way you insult them. You go by and really make them mad, all right? They turn their head, and you say, you're welcome, you know. Just let them. I didn't say a word. I just held the door for her, and she went on through, and I was going to start through too. Now, she wasn't unthankful. She was just simply ungrateful. I think... Hey, I believe we ought to be a grateful people. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Please. These four things you were taught as children or you should have been taught as children. I've heard that and I always found it interesting. It was yes, ma'am, not yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. And please, we were taught to be thankful. When somebody does something for you, you ought to be grateful enough to thank about that and say, I'm thankful for what you did. So one, we all rejoice. Two, we ought to be thankful. You don't have to look far tonight to find somebody who's got a worse day than you've got. Brother Rodney may be watching tonight. They're having, a, they're, they're having a hard time. They're having a struggle down there right now. And I'm not saying a spiritual struggle because Rodney's all right and everybody's all right. But they're having a hard time down there right, right now. I told Barbara, here we sit in our house. We eat our supper. We're both in good health. We're getting ready to go to church tonight. And somebody else is not able to do that. Somebody else got it health issues that we don't have. And boy, my heart's been broke. The Rodney and Carolyn Proctor are two of the best friends that Barbara and I have ever had. I mean, we are that close with them. We were deacons together back in the old Madisonville Baptist Temple. He was there the night Barbara got saved on a Friday night. Hey, hey, I'm talking about we went through Bible college together. First thing he did, and he got out of Bible college and started on his deputation. When I started pastoring here, he was one of the first people to join this church. He's been a member of this church for 35 years now. He's been faithful to God, faithful to the mission field. He tried to plant churches as long as he had the health to plant churches. Now he's in a lot of problem right now. When I say problem, listen, he'll handle it like he always had. He'll, he'll give God the glory. He'll, he'll trust God with it. I, I know Rodney Proctor, but the, hey, you, you need to be thankful tonight that you're not in that bind. One of these days, we'll be where he is. I told Barbara, somebody said, well, y'all go places a lot. We do. We, we don't overdo that, but we do a lot. You know why? Because one day at the snap of a finger, it's going to stop. One of us have a stroke. One of us have a problem. And just snapping your finger, son, it will come to a screeching halt. One of us Monday. I think you all were getting ready to go on vacation when you had your stroke. He's getting ready to go on vacation. Hey, it, 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 it kind of slides things. And I'm not complaining. I thank God for this couple. Hey, they, they, they come to church. Thank the Lord for that tonight. When Jerry and Carolyn come in here, you need to understand it takes a whole lot more to get them here than it does me. It takes a little bit of effort to get things together to get them here. So one, you ought to be thankful. Be thankful in the good times. Ecclesiastes 11, he was talking to young people. He said, Rejoice, O young men, and thy youth. You young people, you better be rejoicing for your youth. You don't know what pain is. You have no idea what pain is. And thank God for that. Amen. But he went on in the same breath. And he told them to remove the sorrow, uh, re remove sorrow from thy heart and put away the evil of the flesh for childhood and youth or vanity. Chapter 11, uh, 12, verse 1, he said, Remember now in the Creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. You know, the, the years will come when you just tell God, I'm ready to go home. I used to tell Barbara, 
I want to go home before I get to the place I can't button my shirt, but I'm already there. So I said, well, we're going to change the parameters just a little bit here. Amen. Uh, because my hands, I try to get that little button through that hole. And thank God for button hooks. How many know what a button hook is? Oh, most people don't know what a button hook is. That's what these women used to use years ago to put. It's a little handle. It's got a long piece of wire that slender. Stick it through the buttonhole, put it around your button, and pull it right through that buttonhole. I've got three of them at home. Sometimes you look in the mirror, everything's backwards. So I try to go this way, but end up sticking myself this way. And then I've got to uh, change around just a little bit. But I'm talking about you need to be, one, rejoicing. Two, you need to be thankful, which leads you to the lot. Uh, last, if you're married, you ought to be worshipful. That's what he's talking about, letting him sing psalms. What's a psalm? It means to play or sing forth praises, to make music, to worship, to celebrate. You ever get a song on your heart? I'm talking about sing me a song about Jesus. Sometimes I get one on my heart. I go around singing that same thing. Oh, don't know all the words. I'm not like Keith. He don't even need a songbook over there. He knows all of the songs. Me, I, I kind of, I get on the wrong page. I get on the wrong line I, and all this type of stuff. But I go around and I sing. I get a song on my heart and I sing it to the Lord a hundred times. Just all day, just sing it. I come in here at times and I'm singing a song when I come in church. And uh, people say, I like that song, amen. Other night when I sang uh, that song, So Send I You. That was uh, Miss Lori's daddy's favorite song. He sang that a lot, didn't he? Brought back some memories. Listen, when you sing outside and you sing psalms and songs like that, it, hey, it helps other people who are around you tonight. Over in 1 Chronicles 16, the Bible said, Sing unto him, sing songs unto him, talk ye of all of his wondrous works. Let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. Over in the book of James, he said, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. If you had a good day today, God gave it to you. God authored this day. God took care of it this day. Now, in the middle of affliction... Somewhere between there and sickness. You ought to have some good days. Don't take the good days for granted. Don't take those days for granted when you feel good. When you've got plenty. When you get to get out a little while or go somewhere for a while. Uh, my pastor used to say just about it was a sin for people to take a vacation. I think it's a good thing to take one. I believe if you don't go come apart, you will come apart eventually. Not everybody's geared to where they can go all of the time. I, hey, go play a game of golf. My dad couldn't understand why any idiot would chase a little white ball all over a pasture to put it in a hole. He said he, said he couldn't figure that. How many love to play golf? You ever played golf? I haven't either. <laughs> I've been out there a couple of thousand times on the course. I just never have played golf yet. I play army golf. Left, right, left, left, right, left, all over the... Hey, I come back with three times as many balls as I had when I... <laughs> I just fish them out of the water and everything else. Listen, if you're having a good day, you ought to sing songs. You ought to rejoice. You ought to be thankful, which makes you thankful, which makes you grateful. You ought to thank God today for His blessings on your life that allowed you to have a good day because one of these days you may be either afflicted or you may be sick. Let's stand tonight and we're going to have an invitation. Is any merry? Let him sing songs. It's a good thing to sing unto the Lord. It's a good thing to sing unto the Lord. While these come tonight, if you need to come, you come. Pray for our sick tonight. I want to remember them. Uh, pray for the Proctors. Pray for the Harrisons. I want to remember them. Pray for all the Kirk and Dolls that are out tonight. Pray for them. Just pray one for the other tonight. Pray you have.